You can't have a successful business unless the community surrounding you is successful. The Pocono Mountain is the birthplace lead to a Pocono wonderland of untold pleasure. Winter in the Poconos, clear and crisp. It's called the land of the waterfall. A recipe for romance. Jeannie and Grant Genslinger, what was the Eddie Hotel and, and what did that mean to you? December 1978, can we go back to that? We opened uh, the Settlers Inn restaurant on my birthday, December 14th, 1978. Um, we were five young kids. Uh, I, was, well, I was 27 then and we, uh, we were little renegades and we left the resort where we were working with the chef the bartender, the server, the hostess, the kitchen, and five of us went and opened a restaurant on our own, and that was in the Eddie Hotel. <laughs> and, and the Eddie is just so we have perspective. That's not where the Settlers is now, correct? No. No, correct. In 1980, mm -hmm. we bought the building that is now the Settlers Inn. We kept the name because everyone said we should. <laughs> but, well, but it really didn't fit in. <laughs> but where was the eddy? Was the eddy close to that? Or I mean, yeah, it, it, it was at the eddy of the Wallenpaw Pack Creek in the Lackawaxen River. So that eddy, and we, were, eddy we were there the for two years, and it was the restaurant and bar were wildly successful. We had music, and it was just crazy busy. It was it was a good experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> we were approached to buy our current location, and it, which had been abandoned. It was a white elephant. And uh, we thought, and we said, no, nah, we don't want to do it. And they it kept needed coming everything. for us. It need, the shingles were blowing off the roof. And, the, uh, you know, it hadn't been occupied as a hotel for a long time, maybe yeah, 15 some, years. Yeah, 20 some. Today, it would have been totally undercapitalized in what you would need now to take a 23,000 square foot building and that needed everything <laughs> and, and restore it. And so uh, we were very fortunate that the community was so supportive and helped us and family helped and, and it just uh, evolved into a very special place. The, the building itself was um, a community build effort in the late 1920s that the reinvention of the town, and so the, the Grand Hotel was going to be built by the town for the advent of the tourist industry because canal and coal had gone, and they were trying to reinvent themselves, and so they went around to all the community groups and sold shares, so everybody in the community owned a share in the Grand Hotel, you know, let's build the town. Yeah, and it was Lake Wall and Popek was built in 1925, so, and they built this in 27 at the height of the Roaring Twenties. And then in 1929, when the market crashed, the project halted until 1944. Uh, in the 1920, when that hotel was built, was in this, in the northern part of the Poconos, were you seeing the same influx of tourists? As well, they believed tourism would come because they built this giant lake, <laughs> you know. Uh, but before that, Hawley, where they put the town, you know, I mean, the town was just three miles from the lake, and uh, they dammed up the wall in Popak Creek, which is the gorge behind the Sil Holly Silk Mill and Ledges Hotel, where the waterfalls, there was a very powerful waterfall there before they dammed the lake, made the lake. <laughs> the building so, was designed as yeah. 52 rooms yeah. with a grand dining room and yeah. all of those things of a traditional English Tudor style hotel would be. And when it finally did open um, in 44, I think, it was a very successful hotel for quite a number of years. Then it closed and was abandoned for a long time. When we bought it, it only had two rooms available. Didn't have any rooms. To, I mean, they all needed to be <coughs> redone. And, but it had yeah. been abandoned for so long. But we pared it down to 19, 19 rooms. rooms. <laughs> From 52. <laughs> yeah. and, you know, to give them you know, a little more space and uh, appropriate bathrooms and things like that. So it was Probably a fun took project. took 12 years yeah. to really yeah. get it to it, it was where a, it should be, yeah. you know, with the arts and crafts style that it is today and, and uh, restoring it. And that's what I wanted to ask because when you 
you go into the building, it does have the character, uh, the telephone in the lobby. Yeah, right? that was original. <laughs> that was from the 1920s. And, yeah, um, or 40s, probably. 40s? So, yeah. I'm sorry, so the 40s. So what, uh, did you keep a lot of the existing fixtures or? Well, the, the, the building had been um, renovated to different styles on the, the interior. So we had, we our renovation took was everything back. uncovering things. Yeah, we were yeah. very fortunate. Uh, when we bought the place, a friend of ours had a house down the street, which ironically used to be a boarding house, and the architect who built and designed the building stayed there, and he found the original blueprints in the attic, which gave us a template of what it was really supposed to look like. So our renovations were the unpeeling to get back to that original uh, Tudor arts and crafts uh, motif. And the major change we did, if there was a major change, was where our bar is used to be a writing alcove because, of course, it was built during Prohibition. And so there wasn't a bar designed for this space. So that, 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 was, that was a, a, an inauthentic change that we had to make. But it had the, the natural chestnut wood that uh, you know, was beautiful. And it had also the bluestone fireplace was original. And so just working around the size of the main rooms were large and easy to just put together it, once we knew what we were going to do. When you bought the property, you said it took a number of years to really get it to 19 rooms to get 19. Mm -hmm. So uh, when did you open to the public then for your first? <laughs> well, we opened to the public. Again, you know, it, it seems like 43 years ago, the expectations of the traveling public was much different than today, especially in the segment of hospitality, the country inn or the inn field. You know, a, a big thing in our industry then, there was a book called Country Inns and Back Roads, and people followed it like with the Bible, you know, going out to all these, these little inns that were being restored and reopened after the um, Holiday Inn and the motel craze. Park your car in front of your room and... Well, then everybody the all wants, you know, everything goes around. So people now wanted to come back to an authentic old hotel. And so we were fortunate enough that the expectations were not that high. So we could redo a room that had an original 1929 bathroom <laughs> and, you know, and, and just do the room. And but to answer your short question was yeah. how long did it take? It took years to finish uh, the renovation, but... When we moved over from the Eddie Hotel, <laughs> 11 days later, we opened Just the restaurant. our restaurant. That because that's at. what we were about, you know, and all of that, and the tavern and the entertainment and all of, all of that stuff. So that was quick, and the other things took time. So the we lodging were just, component took more time. We were just talking about the restaurant. You had a term for farm to table before it was known as that. Well, Grant and I were part in the early 1970s of what a lot of kids, young couples our age were doing, a back to the land. So we came from Michigan, where we had been living at the time, back to Pennsylvania, where I grew up, and we rented a 600-acre farm. We, we started a food co-op at the time and, you know, got the neighbors and everybody were well, sourcing food and very, you know, healthy kind of lifestyle and living on the land, trying to be self-sustaining. Fast forward about 15 years, now we had a, a restaurant that was very popular and we sourced locally, but nobody knew because people really at that point weren't, they only, they didn't know why the food tasted so good, but they knew it tasted really good because it was also fresh. And, and that was coming from, from your, your farm. <clears throat> well, not our farm, because we didn't have that anymore. We had actually moved into the hotel. <laughs> we sold the farm to buy the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> but the, no, we rented the 600-acre <laughs> farm. <laughs> yeah, and then we bought a six-acre farm later, and then we sold that yeah. to buy the hotel when we, when we got into the hotel business. Uh, but <laughs> we did set the mission of the restaurant. Um, I was the chef at the time. The mission was that the food was to represent and support small family farming in our community. So that was kind of the mission of, of the restaurant and getting to know all the local farmers. Um, I think at the time when we started, there was one cheesemaker in the region. Now there's like 20, right? So the cuisine style and everything and the sustainability has evolved to what we had always hoped it would be. So you as a chef, 
Did you, when you started to use, source local, when you started when you were on, then you sourced local, um, how did, do you think that conversion was made farm to table or was it just something that was part of your DNA that you always did in your restaurant? I was a very early member of PASA, the Pennsylvania Association for Sustainable Agriculture. And so I had made a lot of contacts in that and that helped me do the contacts to get farmers to grow specifically for our restaurant and that kind of thing. And unlike you would think, chefs don't tell farmers what to grow. Farmers tell chefs what they're growing and <laughs> chefs need to figure out how to cook it. But that was my <laughs> philosophy on how it's done. You know what, what grows, you know what you do well. Um, and farms in our region are very small and they're very diverse. So a beautiful diversity of product and produce uh, is available. So when you, the, restu the restaurant at Settlers, do you remember what your first dishes were and as, a, as the chef? Well, I remember we didn't have one entree over $10. <laughs> if that tells well, when, you anything. <laughs> I, th I think one of the uh, earliest things that we sourced was uh, the local trout. We became yeah. known for brook trout dishes, smoked trout dishes, yeah. that kind of thing. And that's kind of the style of how things evolved. And then foods locally. that were, you know, part of Pennsylvania. So the mushrooms, you know, down in uh, Chadsford in that area, you know, we, we incorporated a lot of the, the mushrooms into different menus. And we had a partner who was an amazing uh, baker. She worked for Barry Wine at the Quilted Giraffe before she uh, came back to Holly and, and became a, a, our partner for maybe 20 years. Marsha was a big uh, influence for both of us and for our, our, our restaurant at the time. And, and she was also the uh, baker. She did all the, all the baking. And so really so you had off. said, I think I caught this from what you had said originally, was you were really concentrated on the restaurant first. Yes. And then the rooms kind of just started to, to add. Yeah. And right. then when did you start to see the characters of tourism change, the characterism of it change? In other words, were more people coming to the market? You saw the need. I mean, it's very obvious you're, you're incredible entrepreneurs with everything you've done. But when did you see that start to turn? I, th I think maybe after 10 years or so, we began to be very interested in historic preservation through adaptive reuse of structures. So a building like Settlers Inn had to have a good sense of place, had to have good bones and structure. It had to have a sense of place in its community, why it was built in the community, and a sense of place of why it can be the face of a community. So those things started to interest us on the historic side and in historic uh, redevelopment. And also the, the natural aspect, too, of where we lived. So we were, sure. if you're about your sense of place, well, where were we? You know, we were in the uh, Delaware River Valley, Lake Wall, you know, Lake Wall and Pawpack, so a lot of natural areas around us. And at that time, uh, the Pocono Mountains weren't all about the mountains. We were fortunate enough that we just started to really work hard to develop the sense of place. So we started creating itineraries for our guests. So it's kind of fun to see that people were responsive to the natural aspect. So we started, yeah, and experiential you experiential know, uh, travel. Yeah, we created a waterfall tour and a bicycle bicycle tour and things oh, like that. And Jeannie <laughs> and Jeannie and Grant's Woodstock tour. Oh so yeah, we, we would had take, a Woodstock tour because we went to because, Woodstock <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> Whoa, now I gotta get. Wait, let me write that. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that just. Yeah. That okay, well, fun. we need to talk about that one, but <laughs> before we get there, I so you. The brand was at a real tipping point, right? The brand Pocono Mounds, you yes. were, it was starting to evolve. We really worked hard then as a, as a community, a Pocono community, to really uh, bring back the nature aspect, you know, the, the beautiful, uh, you know, the Delaware River that throws through so many of our counties, and then along with the Lehigh River, you know, so bringing the, those two major river systems in the mountains, with the mountains, and then all the, the state parks and the natural areas, of course. <laughs> People came here originally for the nature, getting out of the cities. Well, and it now was, with COVID, yeah. that is even more enhanced. People wanting to be in the outdoors. People oh, yeah, want to experience yeah. Yeah, that's... all of the richness that we have, right? People would come on Friday night from New York City 
exhausted and they would leave on Sunday morning just regenerated, you know. Uh, so, so you were talking about self-care yeah. before a lot of people were, you know, or understood what it was because they had that sense of you got to work hard and keep working and that's yeah. it, you know. And, not I, take and care. I think um, at that time none of us were thinking about what we seem to know scientifically today that if you get out into nature it's rejuvenating but we didn't think about that. We just thought it felt good to be out walking in the woods, <laughs> you know, and seeing stars at night, you know, <laughs> being, still being able to see the stars, things like that. And we would talk about that and, and, you know, to the guests in the garden. Grant was an avid gardener and his mother, and they created beautiful gardens at the, at the end. Yeah, they're, they're, they were well done. So the settlers then started to take off. You started to see more tourism. When did you start to look outward from settlers to, for other opportunities in the Pocono Mountains. <laughs> well, we raised three children at the Settlers Inn. Uh, you know our son, Justin, Justin <laughs> the yeah. youngest of the three. So when they started going off to college, they said they weren't coming back. So kids, they weren't going to come back to the inn. So we thought, well, we have to, you know, we've been doing this for 30 years. <laughs> it's time to see what the next step might be. So then we bought the Sarah Mansion in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, thinking, well, it doesn't have such a big food presence. <laughs> and it was a historic mansion. It'll be easy to retire with easy only ret 20 rooms. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> retire without the, you know, so it, it's ironic that we thought we would retire. Well, we no sooner did that than our oldest daughter came and she wanted to run that place. So she came back first. Oh, that's right, yeah. And then the silk mill. Um, because I was trying to get Holly revitalized, we were both working really hard to revitalize the town. So. Um, that's when the Holly Silk Mill came on the market and somebody wanted to, uh, they wanted to auction it off for self-storage units. And yeah. Justin <clears throat> bought it. Yeah. <laughs> Our son bought it. Yeah. Well, part, then part, they started mm. coming back. Then, yeah. then part of that back, interest in the community and, is yeah. you can't have a successful business unless the community surrounding you is successful. And when anchor buildings were coming up for sale, we realized you can't tear down the fabric of a community and lose anchor buildings because you're never getting them back. So the silk mill was a large, large project. Yes. It's when we renovated yeah. that, um, yeah. Ledges Hotel had come up for sale. That was an abandoned project. And we took that on at Too the same soon. time we yeah. were Just doing well the silk mill. As well. yeah. Justin sold his business in DC and came back full time to this area. And then, then the rest, you know, then Silver Birches came along in 2016. Which is a gorgeous yeah. property on the lake. Yeah. The Holly Silk Mill has a story. And I think... Oh, that's a story. And, and <laughs> I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about that because I, I, we know the, co the college is obviously there, um, the bakery, and all the other businesses that are involved. So how did you decide that and have the vision to get that project to where it is right now? We, my, our son stepped forward, son and Jeannie's brother stepped forward to purchase that. It happened very quickly in a very short period of time. We didn't have a vision for what it was, but we did know that it was an anchor building for the community. So we held three public meetings in the community. Everybody come out, you tell us, what do we need? That we don't have. And we created the box of needs education. We had no college in two counties. Quality of life things, entrepreneurship, small the business, shop. entrepreneur, the coffee shop. So, Which you still operate the coffee shop yeah. as well. Yeah. So all of those ideas created the box and we were fortunate we opened the coffee shop in the old silk vault building where they kept the silk and um, the cocoons, the which cocoon, is why it's called cocoons, right. um, silk cocoons. <laughs> so we opened that while construction was going on and served the construction workers for the first two years. And within that period of time... Well, the college was being built at that time. Yeah, the, the top floor. Yeah, the, the college, which was a great story, you know, if you can ever imagine. We need education, higher education. Well, why don't we just call a couple of colleges around and see... What, Hey, you don't know me. Do you want to open a branch in our town? Click, you know, you roll a dex down, and uh, one step forward in less than four months, they took the entire top floor, did the renovation, mm -hmm. while we were able to secure the funds to start working on the next floor down and the next floor down. It was, yeah. it was quite an amazing partnership, and ironically, that building housed. 500 workers, young women, ages 
um, eight to seventeen that made or the, when it was silk, the silk mill. fabric. Yeah, and five hundred people worked there in the eighteen eighties. Right now, there's a college on the upper floor that has two hundred and twenty-five day students. When, when the Holly Silk Mill came back, you, you were talking about the colleges now that we, because that, there was no colleges in the region, right, at the time. Lackawanna College had a bit of a presence for evening classes in Honesdale, and we had uh, we'd met the president of the college, and uh, we invited him to come and take a look. And he and Justin hit it off. Conservation, preservation, mm -hmm. education became kind of the mission for that. Yeah, and currently we have <laughs> the boiler room's really neat. The I mean, every, room. everything yeah. that how that's preserved, the terrace yeah. to observe the um, I guess it's a spillway now, right? For the lake, or what's the correct term for the, the viewing from the terrace when they when they lower the water level oh, and fall? Well, if they release the water from the, the dam, yeah, that is uh, that is quite an occurrence because it's just a force of water that comes. And then after that's been flowing for a few hours, you can see how powerful those waterfalls were. And that's why it was the first electrically powered building of that size. Yeah, so 70,000 or 80,000 right, so square this, feet this, powered by, its own, by the waterfalls. Right. Powered by water. It was electrified before Thomas Edison electrified the first street in New York City. So it The was Holly Silk Mill was. Yes. So there's a lot of that, that sort of great history, but all of, all of the industrial buildings, including our Legis Hotel, which was a cut glass factory, they were all powered by water and generated the electricity from that. So the lake was in the 20s, the lake itself, 1925. PPL. And that was PPL, correct? PPL, Whoever. It was, originally it was Scranton Electric who sold it to PPL. Where Lackawack Sanctuary is now, that was the... Uh, home of the uh, Scranton Electric Watrous, who, and then they, they uh, came up with the whole plan and then sold it to P P P Pennsylvania Power and Light a Company <laughs> at the time. And they, they leased all the land around the lake, correct? To, to I, th I think Scranton Electric purchased all the land before they sold it to PPL. And so the, there's a whole huge history as part of that. The final filling was finished in 1925. 27. 27. By, by 27. So. It was a two-year project, really, I believe. <clears throat> I think construction on the dam probably started earlier than that. Yeah. But it was a huge, huge thing. And, of course, in the community, <clears throat> Jeannie can tell you, a lot of people in the town, once the lake was there, they wouldn't ever dare go up to the lake. And it just was foreign to them. There was a little bit of a superstition, maybe, in the beginning. Yeah. Uh, Jeannie's dad taught everybody in the community how to swim. <laughs> so, yeah. so this, because, we, were late, we had summer you know, there's on the a lake, lake and my dad got recruited to teach up here. But anyway, that's a long story. Because they really, because yeah. I guess they really didn't go to the shore. There wasn't that kind of tradition here, yeah. right? So no. yeah. they were never around water. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. And the, the lake is a big economic driver now, of course, right? So it changed the whole character of the community. And this whole area, it really gets the focal point. Mm -hmm. But there were other smaller lakes surrounding, right? Oh, that, tons. Yeah. yeah. Lots. It's yeah. land of lakes, really. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. Fairview Lake and Whitney Lake and, oh, hundreds. Yeah. But Walton Pulp lakes. Pack, really the focus. Oh, yes. That of, really changed. Uh, of that. There was a, a gentleman at PPL back in the day who said, this is our industrial park. Getting back to settlers and then some of the other things that you did, this air mansion, now the Holly Silk Mill. Silver Birches, which is really amazing property in location, and there's a tremendous amount of capital put back into that property. Uh, what year was, was that? 2016. Yeah, and yes. that, that, that was a great, Justin, great Justin, transition. Uh, Justin, the generational family that owned it since its beginning. You know, the they Earhart had a family. farm before there was the lake. And the Earhart. They, the yes. Earharts did a terrific job. The next generation, so it would have been the fourth, didn't want to carry on the tradition. So they got together, my son and he got together to transition it to another family owned business. So it's quintessential classic lakefront resort property and vintage. 
yeah. <laughs> and we, you know, we made no pretense in doing the renovation. It's vintage lake, and yeah. it just feels good. You know, all of all of that great. We we, we have one old canoe that hangs uh, in the restaurant outside the restaurant at the entrance. That an owner, a neighbor of ours, bought the canoe at Macy's department store in New York City. In the 30s. In, in the yeah. 30s and brought yeah. it up. Still yeah. has the brass plate on it yeah. and all of it's that stuff. It's very cool. Yeah. And um, maybe if you go to the restaurant, the woody boat that's right. inside, that belongs to our son, Justin. And when he bought it to tool up and down the lake and do all of that stuff, and then after a few mishaps or whatever, we decided to put it in inside the restaurant. And I told Justin, I said, Justin, that saved you about $6,000 a year in maintenance cost on a woody boat. <laughs> Justin know? is a big fan of doing things. Uh, you know, his big expression was go big or go home. So he put that boat into that restaurant. It, it fills up, you know, like a third of the dining space at one point. Your family's very entrepreneurial and partner with a lot of different uh, properties, entities, really, to get things accomplished. But you partner a lot with a lot of other lot Yeah, of and Justin has really, our son has really taken that to heart, that putting together a project is not about our particular family having full control, full ownership. It's putting together all the right pieces of investors that can help make a project successful. Well, you've done so much to really preserve communities and the history of the community. And, and uh, we, we had done something on the lack of waxing in the trails. And I wanted to ask you about that because we interviewed you for that. You've done so much with the trail work and the boat launch. Boat launch. Can you talk a little bit about it? I just think that's, that's yeah. amazing. I think Jeannie and I have always been community activists. That's one thing. And I think our son and our business carry on that tradition of... <clears throat> Getting, give, giving back and being involved in community. Uh, one of Justin's uh, mandates for senior management staff is you must, as part of your work, find a passion project that you love within your community and invest in the community outside of work because it demonstrates that your business, your career, is dependent on your community. So the River Project, I'm very pleased with. Trails are his passion. <clears throat> he talks about a passion project. Trails have been so his that's, press, that's passion been, project for that's been my thing. I've, 20, I've been, 30 years. Yeah. I've been I, very I think, fortunate that um, as a founding member of Delaware Highlands Conservancy, so a land trust that we now have in the Delaware River Corridor, over 20,000 acres preserved for the viewscape, farming, forests, I was very happy and proud to be part of that. But the trails are interesting to get people on the water. It's remarkable. The Lackawaxon project you mentioned, it's a public, state public, navigable river. There wasn't one single public access on the river. So our work has been that. And now uh, by the end of next year, we'll have four access points for fly fishing, nature viewing, kayaking, whatever. But getting people on a water trail or on a bike trail um, is just so important. And it's also a cultural trail. A river is a spine and all the communities that grew along that river were because of the water and then they launched into whatever the town got involved with. So water as the spine is sort of in our area is important on every tributary going into the Delaware. It's, it's the number of waterfalls uh, that powered things, the river that was transportation, the canals that came off of that is, is really shows the importance of water and the importance to maintain the high quality of water to get interest young people in getting on the water, kayaking, fishing, all of that. You think that's inbred that everybody thinks they want to be a fisherman or what? You got to get people to the water. And, and the, we have that all right around us, exactly. which is great. I, I know we could really talk all day long, and I would love to, but I, I want to end this by asking each one of you a, a question, if I could. Um, maybe the two last questions. So the first is, 
since 78 to now, how, whichever one of you, how have you seen the Poconos change in? Well, there's been a lot of growth, but I think more planned growth than um, originally. You know, I mean, it was, uh, the area was so rural and tourism then became, I think, the number one industry and the uh, growth wasn't always as well planned as it could have been. There were traffic corridors that could have been done a little bit better. Uh, so now I think that there's a lot of emphasis on the, on the natural world around us, the, the protection of it, and, uh, and the joy that it brings to the tourism industry, really. You know, if it's, it's a balance, trying to... <laughs> We all want all the tourists, <laughs> you know, everyone wants the tourists to come. And then there's the balance of, of doing it well, handling the traffic, handling the, you know, getting people in and out of the Pocono Mountains uh, right, on a Friday or a Sunday. Sustainability yeah. is our future yeah. in terms of the natural wonder yeah. of our region. Uh, people are proud, proud of it. And um, it's not any more, I think it's, it's recognized a... Uh, from the local people who live in the area, a lot of people have moved here because of the tourism industry. So it's not an us versus them. It's not, oh, here they come. You know, it's let's, let's uh, be good hosts and bring the, bring the guests to our area. And, and this final question, if you come back 100 years from now, what do you think the Poconos will be? The hope would, the hope would be that we have been good stewards of our region and our natural wonders so that it still is the attraction that it has always been that led the original people to move here, that it will continue to be an uplifting, rejuvenation place to visit. Well, gee, I have to end it there, but that was a great place to end it. So Jeannie, Grant, Genslinger, entrepreneurs, number one, philanthropists, just great people. <laughs> it was great to have you today and, and thank you for being here. I'm Chris Barrett, you've been watching Pocono Perspectives and as always, thanks for watching.